Hey, what is up guys? It's your boy Speed here, and today I'm going to be going over five clips between the EG and TNC game and talking about these clips and what I learned from them. This will be a little bit more niche, so every single clip will be on a different subject and topic, so it will apply to absolutely everyone, and I'm very excited to bring these points to you. But nonetheless, if you're excited to learn a little bit about Dota and you want to learn more, go sign up to the Game Leap website right now. We post videos there every single day. I'm continuing to try to improve the content I make over there, and you're really going to notice that if you watch those videos and apply the concepts, you'll get better much quicker. So click the link down below. Give it a shot. There's a refund policy. If you don't like it, check out some Speed's content. I know you're going to enjoy it. All right, I'll see you guys there. All right, so the first clip is a very complex one. It requires an insane amount of awareness and coordination between teammates to apply, but I think you guys can do it if you pay attention. All right, so currently Abed is against Armel's Batrider. What is Batrider's best escape tool? Well, to be fair, all of his spells actually are decent disengaged spells in some regard, but for the most part, Firefly in the early game, allowing you to fly over cliffs and through trees, is your biggest disengage spell. Now, when I put it like that, it's pretty easy to think, oh, okay, so I should gank him when he doesn't have Firefly, but that's the exact point. Now, a lot of heroes have spells like this, and in order to become a better player, you have to be able to recognize when these spells are down and punish it. For instance, Puck's Orb, Magnus's Skewer, maybe a Cold Embrace uh, from Wyvern, maybe a heal from Enchantress. Every hero has, you know, a main defensive spell for the most part. Now, getting into this clip, what I really love about it is the fact that they have a Nature's Prophet. So you can tell that it isn't just subconscious, because for a lot of players, when they go on someone for a reason like this, it's mostly intuition, it's mostly subconscious. They're typically not literally going to think it and say it out loud, but you can tell Unless Sarteezy is the awareness god, um, unless <laughs> unless he is the greatest of all time, which, you know, he, he's up there, he's up there. Unless that's the case, Abed is going to call out this Firefly. He's going to say, hey, Batrider has no Firefly. All of a sudden, Nature's Prophet becomes a menace to Batrider because previous, if you have Firefly and Batrider, it is one of the worst matchups in the game for Prophet. You can't tree and block him and you cannot sprout him, but it goes down and what do you know? instantly a collapse. I remember watching the replay and I'm like, why is he diving this? I don't know if this actually works for our Abed here, but yeah, RTC comes in. They didn't know where he was instantly, but he comes in, gets the sprout out and gets the kill. And it actually ends up transitioning into a double kill. Unfortunately, RTC is absolutely garbage. I just want to point it out here that, you know, unfortunately my profit is better than his because uh, his tree and micro, I mean, come on, RTC. This is his perspective. All right. What is this tree? What's this tree, Micro Arteezy? You're better than this, man. All you gotta do is auto attack. You're playing Nature's Prophet. Like, what is this? You summon trains and then you go AFK with. The You're just auto attacking. <laughs> nah, I'm just messing. But yeah, his micro wasn't the best. He ends up tanking every single tower shot. Absolutely despicable and dies. But let's get into one more clip where this applies. And moving ahead here, once again, you can see that Arteezy actually pings bottom. So I want you guys to pay very close attention to the minimap here and see when and where he pings. So right as the Batrider TP's in, you'll see he goes down and pings it. It's really gonna ping. Like, think about it. If EG is pinging and their own voice comes, in pubs, you should absolutely ping. If you want people to be on the same page, the best thing you can do is ping. I really mean that, so use that as a tool. I know it's basic, but it, it really is key. It's super key. So even in a pro concept, he does it. But getting towards the Batrider clip, you can see after they finish off this Roshan and he gets Aegis, they once again notice that the Batrider has used Firefly to push out the bottom lane. Crit actually TPs in preemptive to our PC TPing in. And once the Firefly ends, he will TP in. And that's exactly how it goes. The Treants and the Sprout are actually useful and they pick up another kill. And it's really cool to see because I know for a fact I despise this matchup. But this makes a lot of sense and a great way to punish it. The next clip is going to be a short one. We're going to be discussing a little bit of a tip you can use to play the dead lane better. So very often as these tanky offlaners, your Dragonites, your Timber Saws, your Centaurs, Tidehunters, very often what you're going to do when your team has pretty greedy cores, right? We see a profit here is you're going to want to take the dead lane, especially as a hero like Timber Saw who really needs items to function. You don't want to just like run around and try to set up ganks like maybe a Mars would. You want to make sure you're putting your priority on getting farm. You know, your hero needs it. And so what does he do? He, he pushes in top. He's going to go top. Okay, pretty standard. Nothing too crazy here. It's also nice. He can kick Gabby out of lane, right? You can assume that um, you can't really die, especially if Eclipse is on cooldown. 
and a lot of the time, you know, Lunas don't even have Eclipse this early on into the game. Gabby does, but, you know, that's his decision. But what I really like is this play. I really like it because it actually completely changes how the lane looks, and yet it doesn't look like much. So what we see is that Ice Ice Ice, 9 minutes into the game, level 6, probably won't die, is gonna pull. Now the reason why I like this pull is if there was a chance for him to die, it would prevent it. Now, to be honest, in this case, I actually think there's basically no chance he could die. I mean, to be fair, at the time, he didn't know where Magnus was. Magnus did max out Shotwave and still have reverse polarity. So maybe, maybe there's a chance they could kill him with the, the Magnus and Luna that were top a second ago. There's a chance. His main threat, though, is the Batrider by a long shot. All right, so Batrider is his main threat, and Batrider's dead. And so I will say in this clip, to some extent, I feel like he maybe didn't have to pull. I have another theory I have in a second. You can see he even tries to farm it, so there's some legitimacy there. He doesn't have a neutral item. His team needs neutral items. And so, you know, just in that, I like to play. But on top of that, it's actually going to give him a bit of a double wave going into this next set. And to be honest, at the 10 minute mark, double waves are not necessarily something that protects you. In the early game, the first five minutes of the game, you can use double waves to shove up really far. That's obviously not what he does here. But all in all, He's going to then push out the wave when he sees the Batrider bottom, and I just like how he transitions this. Even though I don't think the pull was necessary there and didn't really do that much, I do like the fact that maybe it could have gotten him a neutral item, and it's just a good tip in general. If you don't know where your threats are and you're playing the dead lane, you need to remember to pull for yourself regardless of the time in the game. It could be 10, 12, 15, even 20 minutes into the game, pulling is underrated when it comes out of the laning stage, and I really mean that. Alright, this next clip. This is just crazy, you know, uh, you play Dota for 10,000 hours, 15,000 hours, 10 years, and yet still you find new mechanics that you've never seen before. Here's one of them. So Abed was getting gone on really bad fight for EG, absolute disaster. Ortiz, he got, uh, he got killed without being able to press BKB or cheese. So Abed obviously has to get out and <laughs> you can slight TP. What? What? So technically, if you're against something like a Broodmother, and she has like a huge clump of spiders, and the enemy team is surrounding you, they have five heroes, but there's a massive clump of spiders, or like treants, or I don't know, any, any sort of like mass amount of units and a creep wave, you could theoretically slight TP and just live. Is this not insane to anyone else? I don't know. Okay, next clip. Next up, I'd like to give a demonstration and discuss what creep cutting means, or more importantly, creep dragging. So in this clip here, Fly has just gotten picked off on Abaddon. That basically means EG has to go into a full retreat. It's 48 minutes into the game, every hero matters so much. And so, full retreat. Now, what is the best play to possibly make in this scenario? Now, you might be saying, oh, RTC should send Treants down the middle lane. After all, he's a very, he's, you know, a very competent player. He took the 2.5 times Treant HP and damage talent. You know this guy's good. Maybe he should just send his Treants down mid and try to kill the wave. But that would be a mistake. Why would that be a mistake? Because even with this talent, Luna, who will likely go down mid with the death timer of fly, will likely kill the Treants. They're strong, but, you know, a hero like Luna will simply kill them. And so that's what he does. Look, sends these Treants down mid. I love this. Really super advanced stuff. Sends some down mid and actually splits them. And by splitting the Treants, He's able to get the greater trains around to the mid wave. Now, let's look at this clock timer. Does this clock timer mean anything to you guys? 4817, does it mean anything to you guys when it comes to creep dragging? Well, it should. Where is the middle creep wave at 4817? It's funny because <laughs> this is one of those clock timers that I've actually recently added to my, uh, my knowledge of clock timers. Sounds kind of funny, but I, I really mean this. It's when the creep wave is around the middle. It's when it's typically at, at about its high ground. So if I play, here, I'll put it in free camera so you can see. There you go, on the high ground. And that means by sending these greater treants around that the Luna forgot about or, or didn't see how to, I don't actually know, um, then he can go drag. Because of this, the push is over. No creeps, back doors up, no push. That's exactly what RTC does. And it's very important to note, by the way, that he doesn't just start auto attacking the wave. As I talked about, they can kill these treants. He runs it as far as humanly possible. Now, this is the best way to do it, because with units, obviously, you do not put yourself at harm. Heroes like Lycan, Chan, Enchanter's Prophet, Beastmaster are typically the best at doing this. But keep in mind, also heroes like Puck, Ember, Storm, 
high mobility heroes that can drag and cut waves also should be doing this when your team falls behind. So, in the late game, instead of panicking when someone dies, try to remember that cutting and dragging waves is your best option, because now that he's done this, there's no play for TNC to make, and so what do they do instead? Okay, they take a shrine. Who cares? And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to go into a brief discussion of neutral items on right-clicking carries. So here at the 33 minute mark, Gabby has just swapped an enchanted quiver, a very, uh, a very well-respected item, you know, it's it actually is considered to be relatively broken. You'll you'll rarely see a, a pro team get an enchanted quiver at the 27 minute mark and not use it. Um, just for, you know, it's just a nuke on a, like a six second cooldown, um, which is just good. It's just good. But he switched it out for, for spider legs. Now, I'd like to talk about a couple heroes in which I think this is the right decision and why. Also, you guys might have seen yesterday, I made a smurfing video on Luna and, um, I was carrying Flicker for basically the entire game, and I actually stand by that decision for the most part. Now, Luna, I think we can all agree, does an extreme amount of damage, especially with Empower, especially with a Solar Crest applied. You don't really need more damage. However, I think a lot of people would fall into the trap of currently picking up an item like a Leveler, or they would say, okay, I'm just going to use the Grove Bow for some attack speed and attack range, maybe a quick Silver Amulet, or just the Enchanted Quiver. But Gabby decides to go for the spider legs, and I think most pros would agree with him. Obviously, I don't know for sure, but I think most would agree. And the reason being is what is Luna's biggest weakness? Similar to a hero like Terrorblade or Sven, what is Luna's biggest weakness? It's the fact that she gets kited. Luna doesn't move very quickly. She doesn't have a stun. That is why when you pick Luna, you need to make sure that your team has a lot of stuns, which is actually, to be honest, a, a small gripe I had with TNC. They do have the Batrider, but the other three heroes, I guess Magnus is pretty good. Honestly, I'm, I'm on the fence with it. I, I just feel like having like only ultimates as your stun is a little bit iffy with Luna. However, the game was relatively close for like the first 25 minutes, so. But getting back to my point, just keep this in mind. If you're playing Sven and you already have your BKB, Daedalus, Mask of Madness, and you already hit extremely hard, you're much better off enabling the amount of auto attacks you actually get off, rather than how hard those auto attacks hit. And this applies to just buying defensive items in general. Obviously, you don't buy neutral items, but it's like your typical 2-3k MMR carry. Yes, I'm calling you guys out. When you buy another offensive item on Luna, I actually kind of did this in my Smurfing video to be fair, but you buy another offensive item instead of buying BKB, because you say, ah, the game's going incredibly well. We haven't lost the fight yet, which actually is definitely not the case in the Scabby game. But we haven't lost the fight yet. Things are going well. I'm, I'm not going to go BKB. Yes, they have a ton of stuns and nukes, but fights have been going well. I don't really know why, <laughs> but the fights are going well. And just be very careful about this. And I, I kind of just want to say that this is the same concept that Spider Lake's here. Luna will get kited. She will get kited. Unless you're double net worth of the person in second, you're going to get kited. Even then, you'll probably get kited because of the nature of the hero. So address that with neutral items. And yeah, that's going to be the end of today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed this different style. Usually when I do analysis, it's more like free flow or it's more on one topic. This was kind of more bouncing around. And so yeah, smash the like button if you enjoyed. If you want more of these, comment it down below and definitely subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye -bye. Peace. And that's all, but remember, before you leave, come on, before you tune out, subscribe to the Game Leap website, where we are going to help you get to the next rank. If you're stuck, click the link down below, and I'm out. Peace.